Now, this, this day, this significant day when, when Jesus, when God rose from the dead, all these witnesses seeing him, it, it's a time that God said was to be a time of celebration, um, deliverance that everybody now in the world can experience. And, and it's because that he came in the flesh and was killed, was buried, and then resurrected three days later. And it's available for all. And I want to take some time today to review how God had this all planned up and that he shared it first with the Jewish people and the Jewish people then were to share it with the rest of the Gentile nation. So I'm going to give us a little backdrop here of what God had set up. And so follow along today. First, we're going to begin in the book of Leviticus, starting with chapter 23, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocation, even these are my feasts. So first off, what we have to do is we have to understand that these celebrations are God's. They're his, you know, we might call them parties. In the scriptures, they're referred to as feasts or festivals, but they're God's. They're not for the Jews. They're not for you and me. God was giving them so that the people would have something to, to honor him because he wanted a party. He wanted a feast. He wanted a festival. Okay? So the very root of this event, this Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruit, these three spring feasts are what God said are on his calendar, and he wants us to learn about them through the Jewish people. And it's through this a, a celebration. Now, I, I know a lot of times when we think of like a feast, we associate it with a gathering and with food. But those aren't the primary things. That's not what's at the core of this. Now, in the Hebrew... The word for feast is moed, and it means an appointment, or a fixed time, or a fixed season, a festival. So this is something that, in other words, is not going to change. It's cyclical, and every year it will come up on the same time based on God's calendar. And it's, in a, it's just in a fixed event, and it's an agreement that we have made with God that we will celebrate each year. Now, it's also saying here that we are to proclaim, which in the Hebrew means to call out those that are bidden. Now, what's really, really interesting is God himself, in the flesh, Jesus talked about this, and he referenced it in a famous parable. It's in Matthew 22, starting with verse 2. Now, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, he's teaching, and he's using this parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. So, I, I use that to show, hopefully, that we can see the relevancy uh, and un understanding that this invitation to the wedding is very critical, and it's a proclamation that you and I and everyone is bidden. It's a proclamation. And that Jesus has prepared this entire event for us. We were bidden because we're his bride. Now, and, and, and when you think of that, you've got to think about here in the natural, we got some, we can, you know, correlations. I mean, many of us, when we hear about somebody getting married that we know, we'd like to be invited. And this concerns me because what has happened, at least that I've watched in my 56 years, the church in general has done a grave injustice by not teaching the Lord's festivals as God's calling us to come to his appointed times. It doesn't happen regularly. And, and I also want to point out that God, God informs us that his festivals are, are what he refers to as holy convocations. Now in the Hebrew again, this means something like a big event, like we experience here. Unfortunately, I don't think a lot of this is going to happen here in a month or two, but a graduation. That's kind of like what it is, for instance. 
But it also means, a holy convocation means a rehearsal. So in other words, these events, Passover, uh, the unleavened bread, first fruits, uh, in 50 days will be Shavuot, the Feast of Shavuot, or Pentecost. And then in the fall, you have three more festivals of God, or feasts of God, or party of God, the trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. These things, gods are saying, we are to rehearse because we are to rehearse them so that we're ready when the real thing happens, which is what happened in the springtime when the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came, was, bar was killed, buried, and resurrected. Passover lamb, he was slaughtered. Unleavened bread, all the sin was removed, and he rose on first fruits. So that's why we want to practice these. And there are appointed times that God says we're to do it and we're to rehearse these so that we're ready for when the real thing happens and we won't be caught off guard. So this, fall, this spring feast here, the Passover, was God's uh, announcing of his first coming, his first arrival. The first Passover story came about because God had promised to redeem the Jewish people and remove them from their bondage in Egypt. And I, I want to encourage us today, we're not going to do this today, but I want to encourage you to read over Exodus, you know, uh, and, and it talks about the ten plagues. It's recorded in Exodus chapter 7 through 11. I don't know if they're going to have it on. I know they had it on last weekend on, on TV, but the Ten Commandments, the one with Charlton Heston, is a pretty good version of talking about this. They do a very good job um, the, uh, talking about the Ten Commandments biblically, all right? Now, the last of the ten uh, is the death of the firstborn. And God, you know, the first nine, the Hebrews were exempt from. They'd stay in Goshen. They didn't experience the first nine plagues. They stayed in their area of Goshen and didn't experience them. I mean, where there was light in Goshen when there was three days of darkness in Egypt. Okay? Now, this last one, though, the Jews were not exempt. The death of the firstborn. And, and the guidance comes in Exodus chapter 12. And this is where we get the historic significance of Passover for the first time. And we know that night, the first Passover, um, was celebrated on the ninth of this tenth plague in Egypt, the death of the firstborn. Now, on Jesus' day, just like um, in that first Passover, there's a time that the Jews had to prepare for the Passover. And in fact, Jesus is telling Peter and John recorded in the scriptures, he says, go and prepare us the Passover that we may partake. Now, for the Jewish people, this preparation involves an overall house cleaning because they are to cleanse the entire house of leaven, which means to remove yeast, which means for those today, like just today and those that were doing it this week, it was Wednesday night. That would mean, you know, and anybody who partakes in this, that means you could have no Krispy Kreme donuts, Candace, you, no, no Dunkin' Donuts, no Ho-Hos, no Twinkies, no Wonder Bread. Can't have any of that, all right? And, and that is really neat because, you know what? There's a reference to this in the New Testament. Paul's talking to the Corinthian church, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, he says, don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. So from this passage, we're being introduced here kind of or reminded that leaven is not only referencing some kind of bread with yeast in it, folks. In the scriptures here, most of the time, leaven is a symbol of sin. And so the matzah bread we eat at Passover or have for communion is a symbol of purity and righteousness before God. Now, Paul is using this example here to the Corinthian church to explain about a problem they were experiencing there. See, and they wanted to ignore this problem. And the problem the Corinthian church, and sometimes some church bodies do, the it they ignore is called sin. Those in the church at Corinth didn't realize that allowing public sin to exist in the church affects all the members. And please understand something here. The scriptures are not saying we are to ex be expected to have no sin. 
That is not what the message that you're supposed to be receiving here. Because we all struggle with sin daily. But what this passage is bringing out to the front of the discussion is there were some in this early church, it's a new church plant, and had been around only a couple years in Corinth, that there was some deliberate sinning and feeling, they were experiencing that nothing was wrong with what was going on, and they refused to deal with it and repent of it. So the analogy that Paul uses of yeast in bread is that yeast makes the bread dough rise. A little bit of it will affect the whole batch. In other words, blatant sinning, blatant things that are going on wrong, left uncorrected, confuse and divide the body. While believers should encourage and pray for and build up one another, they must also be intolerant of sin that jeopardizes the spiritual health of the whole body. So, it, this ties in the Passover here, because our Father is constantly searching us while, with what? With the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like a sonar that's constantly seeking out in each one of us, if you've received Jesus, the sin. He's comforting you, and he's pointing out things that we're doing wrong. He's here to prepare us to be the bride that'll be spotless for Jesus. Because he's preparing our temple. This is our temple. Now, remember the, when Jesus uh, came in and turned over the tables in the Bible? It happened a couple of times, but do you remember the first time we were introduced to it? Do you know what time it was? It's Passover time. John chapter 2, starting with verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. So he makes a whip and runs people out of the synagogue, out of the temple area. What would we do today if a guy came in here and got a whip and started running people out that were sinning? What would we think? What would we think of that? We'd probably call them religious. I, I'm just telling you what, this is what Jesus did. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Ah, so there were some wrong things going down by people in leadership. They were abusing the people and deceiving them. What had always traditionally been done that Jesus didn't accept was that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were ripping the people off because they had to bring their lambs in for Passover and be inspected. And what they would traditionally do, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, is they'd find something wrong with, like, if Pastor Tom's bringing his, his lamb in to have a celebration for his family, and I was the Pharisee, and I'd be, oh, there's something wrong there, Tom, but you can buy mine right here for $99.95 today. That's really what was going on. That's why Jesus got a whip and a cord and ran them out. Because they were abusing the very people they're supposed to care for. Okay? So that was the first time Jesus did this. And it was Passover. It was the March-April time frame. It was leading up to Passover. It's the week before it. And what's going on is the Father is getting the leaven out of his... Right? Jesus is getting the leaven out of his Father's house, the temple... And we're supposed to do the same thing. Get the leaven out of our temple. Okay? And Jesus did it a second time the very week, right after Palm Sunday, which was last Sunday, he does this very same thing. He overturns the tables again. Now, in addition, we need to add this um, understanding about this cleansing or removing the leaven or the sin. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Peter tells us, and I read from the Aramaic version of the Bible, you also, as living stones, he's talking about us, build up yourselves and become spiritual temples and holy priests to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. That's, what we were, that's one of the things we just do every service. It's a tithe and offering time. And we should really be clear, clear about this. God is well aware of what's going on with us. So he wants us to be like doing what this is. We should be offering up sa spiritual sacrifices to Jesus Christ from a very clean heart. That's the, and it's always, we sometimes get real lackadaisical and go through the motions. And we really take what he did on the cross for granted. But he did it all on the cross for you and I so that we could continue to become cleaner each time. Get clean, in other words. We're spiritual houses, and we need to get the leaven out of the house. 
This is what, you know, we call it spring cleaning, but this is where the original spring cleaning came from, because it's in the spring. Remember, the scriptures say, don't you know? Know you not? Know you not? You are the temple? Now, I want to dig in a little bit about the instructions scriptures give us regarding the lamb during the Passover celebration. So in Exodus chapter 12, and this is God, he's speaking to Moses. So God is instructing Moses on what he's going to tell the people. So here's what God tells Moses back in Exodus 12. He says, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Now there's a four-day period. I don't know if you saw that. You get it on the tenth, and then you keep it until the fourteenth day when you slaughter it. That's when you sacrifice it. Now during this four-day period these people were inspecting the lamb for, for any impurities. Well, I want to show us some things in the New Testament that ties into this Passover feast, which we got to not forget, celebrated for God because it's God's feast. So follow along here. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrives at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead just earlier. So, you, so here at Lazarus' house, you got Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and it's six days before the Passover, and they're having a dinner there, Scripture tells us in John there, in Jesus' honor. Let's continue now to verse 12 there in John chapter 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come from the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. That was last Sunday, Palm Sunday. Now, I want us to think about this. This is the 10th day of the first month named in the Hebrew calendar as Nisan, or sometimes in the Bible it's referred to as Abib. Nisan and Abib is the same month. It's the first month because God said this will be the first month in the Hebrew calendar. And what they're singing at this time in Palm Sunday is Hallel songs. It, the, the Psalms, 113 through 118. It's where we get, Hallel is the, where we get the word Hallelujah. Now, so ha Psalm 118 kind of, we've, we've said this many times, it begins with, this is the day which the Lord had made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We, we've sung, older folks have sung a song like that, maybe the younger folks haven't, okay? But, okay, so what's going on here on this? This is so neat, I didn't get to share this last week. But, so, they're singing that, and what I don't think many people realize is that the high priest is leading a procession in front of him of a lamb that would be slain at Passover. So if you look like at the screen and say north is up and east is that way. So what we had going on on Palm Sunday is coming in the north gate, coming into Jerusalem. And the temple is right up in the upper corner here of, this, of the city of Jerusalem. So they come in. The high priest, in front of the high priest, is a lamb they picked, an actual lamb. <laughs> okay? In front of them. In front of them. And the high priest in a procession, and they're singing Psalm 113, 16, 17, and 18. Okay? That's going on for a while. And they come through the gate. At the very same time, on what we call Palm Sunday, coming in from the east, is Jesus on a donkey with a group of people singing the very same songs praising him, and they collide. They collide at the temple at 9 a.m. last Sunday. Okay? Just think about that. And what's supposed to happen now is an inspection of the lamb. Now, don't you know that the Pharisees were pretty ticked off, so they're going to inspect this lamb that was coming in named Jesus. Okay? Okay? And they're going to be doing it for four days. So look at this in Luke chapter 20. Our Bible tells us this, Luke 20, 20. So they sent spies, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, sent spies disguised, disguised as righteous men 
to ensnare Jesus by a word and to deliver him to the judge and then to the authority of the governor. Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 and 60. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Luke chapter 23, starting with verse 13. Then Pilate called the high priests and the leaders of the people and said to them, You brought me this man as if he were misleading your people. And behold, I have examined him before your own eyes, and I have found no fault in him concerning all that you accuse him, nor even has Herod. In other words, there was no blemishes on Jesus. He was spotless. He had no sin. So, let's back up a bit. About a, about a half a day, and we're at the Last Supper. Today, it's referred to by the Jewish people as a Seder meal. For those of you who came last night, you, you, if it was your first time, I hope you enjoyed it. Right? But all the people do this. They have it in their homes all over the world, Jewish people. And this is the same thing the disciples were having that we referred to as the Last Supper. Now, there had been a few things adjusted through the years, but it's mainly that exact same thing. Now, it's during this meal that Jesus instructs them and breaks the bread, the matzah bread. It's bread without sin, without yeast, I mean. And he hands it out to them, and, and Jesus grabs the cup, and it's the third time he's grabbed this cup. And he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which has been shed for you. And he did this after they had eaten supper. Now, there are four specific events that equate to the drinking from the cup during this Last Supper meal. And I want to go over the original source that told us about these four different times and what they mean. Again, it's found in Exodus. This time, though, we have to go back even a little further to Exodus chapter 6, starting with verse 6. This is God again speaking to Moses. I've told you before, that's why I always put them in red. Whenever God speaks in the Old Testament, in many Bibles, it's not in red. I think the dad should be in red if the son's in red. So that's why it's not up there right now, but it's supposed to be red. That's okay. But I, it's, it's God speaking. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to, my, to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, now, many of us don't know that, and we kind of gloss right over it. But I want to point out that the very same four cups that we celebrate at Seder meals, and that the Jewish people do to this day, are right there. One is, I will bring you out from under the burdens. Number two is, I will rescue you from their bondage. Third cup is, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And I, fourth is, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. So the first cup that you do, that they did at the Last Supper, that we do at a Seder meal, is called the cup of sanctification. Because it says, I will bring you out from under the burdens. He is sanctifying us from all the trials and tribulations and troubles we've had. This symbolizes how Jesus has freed us from the yoke of the burdens and the cares of this world. Jesus wants to take our load, folks. He took our load, so why, why are we carrying it? Now, the second cup is the cup of deliverance, a cup of remembrance. It says, I will rescue you from their bondage. He's it's not only does God want to lift off the burdens from like the first cup, but he also wants to destroy the chains that tie you to the bondage of this world. Pastor Matt did an excellent example Wednesday of saying, we got to destroy those things. We should be destroying them. We don't just break them. We eliminate them so that they're not even there. We destroy them. We blow them up. The chains. So the load has been removed, and those ankle chains have been destroyed but they're still not free until somebody pays the redemption price. That's the third cup, the cup of redemption, where God said back in Exodus, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Remind you of anybody? 
And I want to comment on another specific part that goes on that's tied into the Hebrew heritage here, the Seder meal her heritage. And it's this part where um, we did it last night, it's called the matzotosh. It's a bag for matzah. And it's unleavened bread, so it's a, a bag that carries unleavened bread. And during that time of the Passover, the, the father of the family will pick out the middle loaf. And, and if you ask the, G, the Jews and the Hebrews and the rabbis, why the middle loaf? They go, I don't know, it's tradition. They'll say things like, because it's a three-in-one unity, they'll say it's something like, well, um, this represents the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they'll say the second loaf is Isaac. They'll, they also say it could be, we're three-in-one unity with worship, the, the priests, the Levites, and the people. So they bring out the second law for the Levites. They have some other reasons. But for a Christian, here's what we believe the three-in-one unity represents, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so they bring out the middle loaf, and they break it. And they wrap it in a cloth called an afikomen, which is a Greek word for this bag. They wrap it up in, and the Father goes and hides it. And this is such an important part of the meal the meal cannot be continued or finished without the retrieving of that hidden piece that he'll take outside and go and bury it. Wrapped up in a linen cloth. It's unleavened bread. It has no sin, in other words, in it. And so that's what they do. And it, that unleavened bread, again, like I, we talked about last night, it's pierced. It's very thin, a piece of matzah bread. It's very thin, and that's a loaf, and it's pierced. It's cooked and it has brown spots on it like it's bruised. And it has rows in it like stripes. He was pierced for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53. It's right there. It all ties in. And the, the part of that meal, it also means that will, which comes later or sweet dessert. The psalmist said, taste of the Lord and see that he is good. Now, when the, the, and the kids are the ones who get to go find this, and it keeps them engaged, and you, they might be a little bit more uh, interested then if they get a little gift, so that's how they've tied in getting the kids be involved, and the kid will get a reward for bringing and finding that lost piece. And this continues then, and then they break off, the, they get the Afi Coleman back, and they break off the bread, and they give everybody a piece. Well, what does that sound like? It sounds like communion. That's exactly what we do at communion. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And, and this doesn't take place until they're ready to drink the third cup, which is the cup of redemption. So, Remember, like, you see the correlation. Jesus was buried, death, and, and, and wrapped in a cloth. And he was brought back, conquering sin and death. And see, I hope we can see the tie, and it, makes, it should make clear sense of why Jesus took the bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. I hope we can see clearly the picture that God was setting up all these centuries ago. And then Jesus takes that third cup, and, and this was after they had supper, had supper, and this is the third cup, cup called the cup of redemption. And those first two cups are sanctification and deliverance. They came before the meal, then the meal, then the retrieving of this bread that was buried. Bread represents him, and he takes the third cup, and Jesus says in Luke 22, verse 19, takes the bread and gives thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for your sake. He did that for us. He said, this do in remembrance of me when we partake of it. And he said, likewise also, he took the cup after they had eaten and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. So we find Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples taking this third cup and the bread and saying, that what you waited for. Because the Jews have been waiting for this. That which was promised. I mean, it was written. They've been waiting. It's promised. The new covenant has now arrived in my blood. Eat and drink. Hallelujah. Now, I wonder what those first disciples felt after celebrating Passover 
year after year after year, and then experiencing its fulfillment right before their eyes. I mean, to experience how God wove into the Passover festival the greatest picture of all for the redemption of the world from the sin of Egypt, the bondage of the Passover land, who is Jesus, the Messiah. And today, you and I partake, if, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've applied by faith, you know, the blood of his sacrifice to the doorpost of your home, heart here. Because back in Egypt, they would slaughter that lamb and they'd put it in a basin and they were to take hyssop and they were to put the blood on the top lentil and the two side posts. They'd dip the lentil with the, they'd get their uh, hyssop plant, put it in, in the lentil of blood, or in the barrel of blood, and then they'd put it on the top lentil of their door and the two side posts. It's exactly like the cross. The symbols were all there. And we are to do that very thing with the blood of Jesus on the doorpost of our hearts. That's what we are to do. And then the fourth cup. The fourth cup. It's the cup of acceptance. It's the cup of joy where God himself said, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask the band to return. So after this final cup, they drank that. The meal was finished. Here's what the Bible says they did. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the... Mount of Olives. And the, the hymns that they would sing, again, would be Psalm 113 through 118. They would have sung this kind of Psalm, 118, verse 21 through 23. They would have sung, I will confess, praise, and give thanks to you, for you have heard and answered me, and you have become my salvation and deliverer. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is from the Lord and is his doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. And they were singing that. He's the capstone. They are singing to the Messiah, Jesus, that he would be the stone the builders rejected. I pray that we can see more clearly how this Passover story is so relevant and that we have gained a greater understanding, more wisdom of God's word today as we recognize this is the day we celebrate our risen Christ. Jesus. Hallelujah. I mean, wow. This is, this is something that I think at times we don't understand why the significance of the Hebrew people, but it was for the, Jesus came for the Jews first and then the Gentiles. So that's why we here continue to always bring these up, not because we're waiting for the Savior. Uh-uh. The Savior's come. We're doing this because we're rehearsing it for the other time when he comes for his second coming which comes probably in the fall, because those haven't been fulfilled. So we want to stay up on all of these festivals of God, mainly to obey Him because He said to do it. Not because I said to do it, but because in His Word He said to do it. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to ask the ushers to bring the buckets up here. As we always do, this is one of the three times a year God's Word says that everybody comes forward and brings Him a special offering three times a year. This is one of those times. We've been praying and fasting this week. The fast will end now. Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah. But it's a time to bring an offering. If, if you weren't prepared, you can do it online. Those watching, you can do it online because this is to God. You need to understand. He said to do this forever, to honor him because it's his festival. It's his party. So let me just say a prayer before this. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for us today that we have this opportunity to honor you with our offerings father to bless you because it's your party we thank you lord for what you've done with your son this day he's resurrected he's alive we thank you father for oh so much more that you have us here we thank you for your grace and mercy we thank you lord for your patience with us and father we ask a special blessing over these offerings and those that are giving right now father that that it will just encourage them to continue to obey you and obey what your word says and honor you above everything else. In the mighty and matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen.